Mm. Hello, everybody. Hmm. Good to see you all. Hello from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Michelle and I are both here uh, getting ready to go teach a retreat up at Vallecitos in a couple days. And uh, yeah, nice to tune in to our Sangha sitting in the midst of travel and disorientation. I'm figuring out how to see everybody on my cell phone, so that's exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new experience. <laughs> hmm. So we're, um, we are just a little in the midst of the transition. So it's going to be a little bit of a simpler sitting today. Well, Michelle will guide us in a sitting. I'll um, offer a short talk and then we'll just kind of wrap up today that we won't take any Q&A. Um, but we're yeah really happy to be here with you all. Get back to the quiet. Mm. Of course, as usual, feel free to you know take a look around, see who's here with us this week. And feel the goodness of this formation we're building together. Hmm. Actually, interesting with the cell phone. <laughs> I see everybody singularly. It's great. <laughs> hmm. It's great. We hope you're all well, well enough in this world. Okay. Jesse, I don't see myself. Is that okay? I guess so. We can see you, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, you might have to like slide back if you want to it's see us. Okay. I'm happy this way. Good. <laughs> hmm. huh. So we enter into this uh, field of awareness where the emphasis is not so much on the experience that we're having itself, but how we're relating to the experience. And yet the paradox is that we ask you to be very um, at, well, as connected as you can with each moment's experience as it's coming and going. And if you can, um, also under, there's a understanding we bring with that. So there's the connection, but also the understanding that mostly whatever's appearing, we can't control. that it's happening so quickly. Thoughts, sounds, smells, tastes, body sensations, emotions. We can just see how we don't control the appearance of what's happening, but how we relate to what's happening. So, of course, bringing that deep understanding that often things can feel very personal. But when we explore and look carefully at what's happening, it's when there is a deep sense of identification with what's happening. That we believe we should be able to control what's happening. And so there's this increasing sense of it being mine and me and I or yours or ours rather than a sound just coming and going by itself or a thought just coming and going by itself. 
body sensations appearing and disappearing as they are. And so it's often helpful at the beginning of a sitting to just remember that we can incline towards some kindness, care, or very subtle or sublime abiding in a kind of tender vulnerability. Because of this aliveness of our moment to moment experience and so much change, there is this tender vulnerability that we don't know what's going to happen next. And lastly, there's just that ease of well being where we really can just let things be just as they are with just what's apparent. And of course, all kinds of embellishments and judgments, ways we can get rid of or fix things can arise. And we can just let the attention just drop into the flow of what's apparent. So of course, it's often for some people easier to begin with an awareness of hearing. Just letting whatever textures and vibrations are appearing. Letting them emerge and be just as they are. Deep rest and ease that we don't have to control them. Just noticing them appear live and disappear. There's that quiet that comes from letting the attention go with that flow of things just as they are. And we can let the attention just lightly drop into our hands, the surface, the skin, deeper inside.
whatever calls the attention. Just what's apparent. There's the word hand. And then the direct experience of the physical ch sensations changing moment by moment. You can abide there longer. You can also shift the attention just. This in a relaxed way, just lightly shifting to the movement of the breath at your abdomen. And you check, you don't have to force, but you check to see, can you receive the movement just as it's happening? We understand that movement's nature. Coming and going. Appearing, disappearing, not me, not I, not one. The moment, our moment to moment experience is flowing like water, vast stream of change, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. So at times, one just lets the attention just totally drop into that stream of change. Body sensation, thought, sound, body sensation, emotion, breath, smell. It's going much faster than words can express. Sometimes 
the attention will just focus in again on hands, movement of breath or sound. One small area of the universe that's changing. It can be very anchoring and secluding. Tranquil. So we find that rhythm of going with that sixth sense door moment to moment. Awareness, non-doing awareness. And if we get lost or caught up, trying to control, manipulate, it's helpful to anchor again.
Ding. 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 Thank you, Michelle. I like that. I think we should keep that. Oh, you're muted there. Hold on. What'd you say, I said, Michelle? I said just being a bell. <laughs> So, um, as I said in the beginning, you know, Michelle and I are uh, traveling again right now to to teach, and it's such a different mode, you know, of being. Mm -hmm. I think you know, since the pandemic, and it's still been this kind of slow process of sort of coming back into some engagement in the world and more travel and and you know as you know sort of us trying to figure out what the future of that looks like for us and you know what makes the most sense in terms of our lives and the planet and our responsibilities um but there is always learning you know and just the the way of, of engagement more with people and the unpredictable swarms of the airport and airports and uh you know just the the for whatever reason you know it's like we know of course every moment of experience is unknowable and it's uh, unpredictable you know in terms of what's about to arise and what's happening and you get sensitive to that in the internal level there is a wildness to just a whatever might be happening at any of the sense doors you know even if it's rather neutral experience but there is something about you know kind of going more out into the world and having all kinds of just human interactions you know that are much more pervasive much more um you know the the unpredictability of that the, the the goodness and hardship of that is you know it's of course very evocative and and sometimes in a different way than just you know noticing light formations at the eye door with their eyes closed you know mm. and it can be hard to it's so hard to manage the mind's response just to the kind of non-conceptual experience of of our direct experience of the sense doors and how much harder it is when we're in the world and we're engaged and we have you know work to do we have a you know a, a goal to get to and there's all this other interaction you know and and all these other minds hearts bodies you know sense congealings are you know doing their interactions and we're all ping-ponging against one another and and in general, I actually my life in the last month or so, and maybe the last few months really has been kind of more social than um, I've been used to, you know. And even just in the time I've kind of come back from my last teaching trip and and traveling, um, being back home, and not having it be maybe sort of as quiet or protected or kind of contained as sometimes I'm able to have it, but. You know, I've made the choice to be a little more engaged in certain um, interactions and, you know, human life and culture and, you know, um, social dynamics and realities than I often am. And, 
and, and mostly, you know, it's felt like important, you know, there's, I think this question that we all, you know, as people dedicated to the kind of practice and cultivating this, you know, these beautiful qualities of heart and mind and, and, and finding these conditions under which we can sort of cultivate them and, and try to kind of purify and perfect them even um, in the kind of laboratory of internal experience you know, always that sense of how much of that and how much interaction, how much engagement, how much are we, you know, testing these qualities out in terms of our um, cultivation and their limits and their boundaries and their challenges and their their fruitfulness, you know, in the world around us. So I've had a, a, a range of them, but I just wanted to speak a little about one kind of sector of it, which has been, you know, sort of since being home for a while, this... Um, kind of a few decisions to kind of engage in a community that I'm involved in of um, weaving a, um, this traditional um, Hawaiian um, material, uh, lao hala, it's the leaf of this hala tree. Lao just means leaf. And the puhala is this, uh, it's kind of like a palm type, palm kind of tree, if folks aren't familiar, or folks not from Hawaii. Um, and it's traditional in Hawaii, it's traditional through a lot of Polynesia and even the Philippines and um, different places where these plants are, you know, kind of native to a bunch of area around the Pacific. Um, and so, you know, people weave all kinds of things, you know, traditionally, like the sails of the canoes and mats to lie on and sit on and um, uh, baskets for carrying things, you know, very practical daily use um, fibers, you know, and, and art and, you know, craft, but also very, you know, practical for daily use. And, and in more modern times, it's people make all kinds of other more fun things, water bottle containers and wallets and purses and hats, you know, that's sort of like the, the highest level really are these incredible papale, these beautiful hats that people make woven with just, you know, incredible strands of this material and it takes a lot of work just preparing the material itself, gathering it, cleaning it, um, you know, um, preparing it to be woven. And then there's just all the practice of the actual weaving. And so, um, since the pandemic, this kind of weaving group that I'm a part of has started to gather again, and I hadn't been able to go, you know, since it started back up this spring, I'd been traveling. And so I decided to go, uh, you know, a few weeks ago and just something so wonderful about, you know, any size gathering of, of people who want to come together and um, try to practice something, you know, that means something important to all of us, you know, and, and there are people who may be experts at it. And many of us who are not so expert, <laughs> uh, and, um, understanding that just by gathering and just by trying and by sharing and learning, you know, and asking questions and watching others and just sort of absorbing the knowledge that's around that we're gaining and we're, um, learning, but we're also perpetuating something really beautiful, you know, a lineage, a tradition that um, in Hawaii for sure was threatened, you know, with colonization and so much of the loss of, you know, old traditional indigenous arts and knowledges, you know, and of course they're not any, any one of these things that you might study, it's, it's root goes into everything, right? The lessons, the, the wisdom that's learned there around how we relate to the plants and the environment and what that means about how people are relating to one another. And, um, you know, any, any one sort of lineage or tradition you go into deeply is profound and um, starts to see how it can connect with, you know, many others, language and culture. What a gift it's been for me, you know, and kind of, trying to just do my simple projects, you know, I'm just working on a, a simple mat, you know, um, but that it's a lot of work, of course, you know, and 
something about that process of, you know, knowing that you have these um, ku, the, the warp, you know, that you're, you're setting out the kind of basic parameter of your, you know, intentionality and that you're taking all of these other strands and kind of weaving them through over and over and, and trying to do this with, you know, really it's cultivating their skills and they're also, they have a moral quality, you know, patience and determination and, um, you know, a lot of these lessons that come through of like not to weave when you're frustrated, you know, to put it down. This, one of my teachers said to me once, you know, it's like the, the Lao, the leaf, you know, the Lao will always win if you're trying to weave, you know, frustrated. I think there's something that we can understand in that, you know, in terms of our meditation practice. It's like we have these, you know, in, these intentions of, you know, maybe it's loving kindness or mindfulness, right? As this like kind of primary um, emphasis and intentionality forward, you know, patience, equanimity, uh, determination, renunciation. You know, we think of the, the, the paramis, these beautiful qualities that we're trying to cultivate in the heart, mind, body. You know, we set this intention and then we're weaving in, okay, here's sound vibration coming in. Like, can we weave that into the, the, the warp of our mindfulness, of our kind heartedness? You know, here's a sensation in the knee, here's a sensation in the back, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. You know, it's like working when you're working with a natural fiber, there's all kinds of um, inconsistencies, you know, and um, uh, variabilities in, in, and, and yet this intention to sort of keep weaving it, keep weaving it in, keep weaving it in, and how beautiful it is to try to create something with that carefulness, with that, um, these qualities of intention, right, and the skills, right, that to recognize it's not just a, it's not, goodness isn't just a, goodness is a skill. It's not just like a mysteriously appearing quality, right? Uh, mindfulness is a skill. These are things that we develop over time, right? And we learn to kind of navigate with different kinds of material that we're receiving in the body, in the sense store, trying our best to do it skillfully, you know, to not exclude anything from this, you know, material of life that we're creating and this material is this community that we create and this, whether it's for ourselves or this Sangha or just the life that we're creating, right? It's like, where do we try to include everything in terms of the weft, right? Um, and include everything, you know, knowing that the heart has that capacity to weave in anger, right? To weave in disappointment, sadness, grief, loneliness, physical pain, emotional pain, you know, all of it can be brought into the fold, you know, mm, how beautiful that is, how important. And yet how hard, you know, there is something of like doing it with just a few strands is, is like sometimes manageable, you know, when we're sitting here and we have like six sense doors and like, okay, with these six things, we can kind of weave back and forth a little bit and feel like we get our way, but we enter the world, we enter community, we enter relationships, and suddenly there's all these strands, you know, all this complexity. And yeah, it's very hard, you know, seeing some of these kumu with these teachers with their apale, their hats, you know, with hundreds of strands of, of lao, you know, coming out and keeping track of all of that and the meticulousness of it and the labor of it, you know. It's not just mystical, you know, it's work. It's an endeavoring and it's a skill and it's something that we start where we start and we get better at, you know, through the training little by little. And it's good to be humbled, you know, this, this, this mat I had started weaving when we gathered together, I realized when I got home, I had totally done it wrong, right? There was something I was doing on the edges that I needed to not do when I was doing the center. And, it ended up being more like a pocket, you know, instead of a woven mat. And so it's like, okay, you just got to undo it. You know, you just like take it all apart and start from scratch, you know, and 
And that's the learning, you know. And this part about being in relationship and community and engaging with others, when it comes to the practice, I mean, that's, you know, this sense of like, we can't undo in the same way, you know, once we've woven in something that's been a harsh speech, you know, or impatience or judgment or anger, you can't just unweave it, you know, but there is that sense of like, can we stop and go back and try to repair, right? The, the humbleness, the humility, the, the frustration sometimes and the impatience that can arise in those moments, where are we willing to kind of go back and apologize and, and, and try to reweave something in a different way? You know, recognize that we were at our limits and we didn't know how to incorporate that material at that point, you know? how important it is to do that how you know how humbling but that way we learn better you know it's like actually taking it apart and starting back and starting fresh and trying to repair places and do things right you know so that what we're building is the right thing and feels that it honors you know our what we were trying to do and the, the lineage that we're a part of that's teaching us how to do things you know in a good way how important that is. Where is that sense of responsibility, you know, not just to one another, not just to ourselves, but also to something that we're holding, right? We've received something from the past. We've been entrusted with teachings. We've been entrusted with some goodness. And we have a responsibility to something beyond us, you know, and beyond what we can even see right, to the future of, of what are we doing in this little life that we have, you know, what is the, are we able to weave one thing here that's good, you know, and that's providing a foundation for something next to come along that's good, that's helpful, it's part of the goodness, you know, and yet, of course, how hard it is when there's so many strands and so much wildness, and how important it is sometimes to just come back to the simplicity. It's like, oh, am I being kind? Can I find a way to kindness in this situation? You know, am I being patient? Can I find a way to patience? Can I at least refrain from harm, refrain from something that I know is going to start weaving something difficult, you know, in our own hearts or in the world around us? Where do we put something down, know when we've hit our limit, and be careful, you know? It is amazing, you know, of course, to be here in New Mexico and so many incredible traditions alive here. And Many of them also very ancient. Michelle and I went to a museum today where there was an exhibit of just these incredible. I mean, that word doesn't even begin to describe these Navajo weavings, you know, blankets, rugs. Amongst many other beautiful, incredible traditions that were represented there, just, just looking at the weavings, you know, like how beautiful, you know, how powerful, how much joy and beauty and pain and heritage, you know, is woven into these works of art, you know, which also, you know, for so long, were also just of daily use, you know, and, and practical as well. Where do we have that sense of like, uh, that we are always in this process of weaving our own culture? Right, whether that's a, a, the culture of self right now in this moment, you know, of, of the, the being that we are creating and generating and weaving every moment, the, the culture of the world that we're in and the, the communities that we're a part of, culture that we may have inherited, right, that are very old, ancient parts of our composition you know, the sense of responsibility in that and wanting to learn how to do it better, you know, to weave these lives and 
more and more full and beautiful and skillful ways, you know. But also ways that allow for the imperfections, you know, that that aren't just for sale. You see so much of whether it's here or there or anywhere, you know, so much of these crafts, the a way that they have become supported is through more industrial processing. You know, they people have to make a living doing these things, and it's very hard to do it doing it in the old way because any hat is going to be like thousands of dollars, you know, and so it's easier to start bringing in, you know, machines and anyway, all of that stuff, right, where there's a reason for it. We understand this is part of how things do get perpetuated and saved is by making the people be able to make a living off of them. But on the other hand, if we're just talking about culture, because bhavana is a word, meditation practice is the culture is another translation of that. We're not doing it for money. We're not doing it for, it's like, where do we also, where are we able to rest in the old ways? Right, the old skills and practices and and the the imperfections of that, you know, the the human texture of something that's been done by hand. Um, how important that is, how beautiful that is. And then the place where the metaphor breaks down too, right, where there is something in all of these traditions, which is so much about identity and so much about weaving something that's tying the old to the future through us in this moment, right? And the value of that and the beauty of that and the, the kind of coherence and perpetuatingness of that, you know? And that also in our practice, there is a different understanding, right? Of, of that we're not weaving something that gets, that lasts. Right, that in every moment that we're weaving something that is immediately disintegrating and dissipating. Right, so that there is this incorporation of whatever is happening into the warp of these, you know, beautiful intentions of the mind, but also seeing that it unravels immediately. That we're not creating a self that's um, solid or beautiful or sustainable or or um, perpetuating anything, right? There's a way in which goodness doesn't need to be woven into anything. There's a way that patience doesn't need to congeal into anything solid. And that as a way of life, there is a, an aspiration in our practice towards not needing to create anything through our goodness, through our mindfulness. And so there's that paradox of this, which is important, right? To really honor that there is something about the, the practice and the simplicity as Michelle offered it of just like, we're just observing, we're not, it's non-constructive. It's letting things arise and pass on their own. And that what gets generated through that is so beautiful and yet it doesn't need to be validated by the construction of anything. The least of all of me at the heart of it. And that is the deepest honoring of the tradition. And it's the deepest honoring of the future to not create something that needs to be defended and protected and identified with and, and solidified and doesn't have the pressure that's keeping it together the unwoven goodness of the liberated mind. Our deepest aspiration. So maybe I'll we'll leave it at that today and um, send you off with as much goodness as you can <laughs> handle and muster and cultivate yourselves, you know, for this coming week. We're not sure exactly what our internet and da, 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 but of course there will be a gathering next week. We may be there. There may be others. <laughs> we'll see. 
and we look forward to um, yeah seeing you again soon hopefully next Sunday and again if, if Michelle or I aren't there when someone will be holding the space I can keep weaving this goodness that dissipates on its own every week <laughs> take care everyone <laughs>